Well, we have a number of uh, women who are gone at the uh, women's retreat right now and will be coming um, back. Um, so I've heard from, from Christina that it's going really well. And I heard in passing while I was walking through the lobby that at least one dad watched Lord of the Rings with, uh, with their children. So I'm glad that wise decisions were made by some. Um, and, you know, Lord of the Rings is uh, an epic story, and the characters in it at one point um, even recognize that they're part of a big story, right? Um, I believe it Sam said to Frodo something like, I wonder what kind of story we've been thrown into here. And their sense that they're part of something bigger shaped their identity and mission and purpose and what they knew they were called to do in the midst of that story. That's a bit of how we find Israel in the Old Testament, in the text that we're going to look at this morning. So if you'd open up to Leviticus 26 with me, uh, this is on page 104 in the Bibles around the room under the uh, pews and, and chairs. And Leviticus 26 is nearing the end of the book of Leviticus, so we're almost done with the series, I'm giving you a heads up for those of you who will miss it um, and those of you who might not. Uh, we'll have one more uh, Sunday after this. So, Leviticus 26 is toward the end here, and it's a, a moment in Israel's story where they recognize they've been rescued by grace, God has given, him, given them His good commands, He's caused His presence to dwell with them in the tabernacle, and now Israel has to decide what they're going to do with this. This chapter is a call to respond, and it clarifies for Israel that they have two paths before them. It's a call to choose their path. God offers them blessings for faithfulness or judgments for unfaithfulness. So it's a moment of deciding what their future is going to be. There is one more path, though, that can open up down the road. What happens if they travel down the second path, the path of judgments for unfaithfulness? Well, we may expect there to be nothing left for them. The path just gets darker and darker in judgment. They've made their own poor choice. But God is a God of grace, and there's a third path that opens up, and it's the path of restoration. They can be restored on the path of blessing. So all these blessings and judgments that we're going to see are part of a bigger story of Israel, and it's all set with the backdrop of Eden in mind. So we've talked about that all through the series. This is about restoring the life we lost in Eden. So Israel is to see themselves once again as a new Adam and Eve. They're to once again faced with the choice of either faithfulness to God or unfaithfulness. And they'll be blessed for faithfulness, judged for unfaithfulness, and offered the hope of restoration for repentance. So we'll walk through these sections together. But let's read the whole chapter first. And let's pray before we do. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we thank You for the story that Israel found themselves in that's the same story we find ourselves in, and we thank You that You shape our identity and purpose uh, within this story. So please help us to not only understand Your Word, but also history and our own place within this. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Leviticus 26. You shall not make idols for yourselves or erect an image or pillar, and you shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you your rains in their season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest shall last to the time of sowing, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. I'll give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid, and I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. You shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword." Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and will confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat old store long kept, and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people." 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. And I've broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. Now verse 14, on to the second path. But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commands... If you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consume the eyes and make the heart ache, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I'll set my face against you, and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. And if in spite of this you will not listen to me, Then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins, and I'll break the pride of your power, and I'll make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its increase, and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will continue striking you sevenfold for your sins, and I will let loose the wild beasts against you, which shall bereave you of your children and destroy your livestock and shall make you few in number, so that your roads shall be deserted. And if by this discipline you are not turned to me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I myself will strike you sevenfold for your sins, and I'll bring a sword upon you that shall execute vengeance for the covenant. And if you gather within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I break your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in a single oven, and shall dole out your bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. But if in spite of this you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and shall eat the flesh of your daughters." And I will destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and cast your dead bodies upon the dead bodies of your idols, and my soul will abhor you. And I'll lay your cities waste and will make your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not smell your pleasing aromas. And I myself will devastate the land so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled at it. And I will scatter you among the nations, and I will unsheath the sword after you, and your land shall be a desolation and your cities shall be waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths, as long as it lies desolate, while you're in your enemy's land, and the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest, the rest that it did not have on your Sabbaths when you were dwelling in it. And as for those of you who are left, I will send faintness into the hearts, into their hearts in the lands of their enemies. The sound of a driven leaf shall put them to flight, and they shall flee as one flees from the sword, and they shall fall when no one pursues. Verse 37, they shall stumble over one another as if to escape a sword, though none pursues. And you shall have no power to stand before your enemies. You shall perish among the nations, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And those of you who are left shall rot away in your enemies' lands because of the iniquity, and also because of the iniquity of their fathers, they shall rot away like them. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me, And also in walking contrary to me, so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I'll remember the land. But the land shall be abandoned by them and enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They shall make amends for their iniquity because they spurned my rules and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they're in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn them. Neither will I abhor them so as to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sake remember the covenant with their forefathers, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes and rules and laws that the people, or that the Lord made between himself and the people of Israel through Moses on Mount Sinai. So Israel is faced with a choice. There's paths forward. God offers them blessings for faithfulness, judgments for unfaithfulness, and then in His grace, abundant restoration for repentance. So let's walk through these sections and then consider where we fit in this story. So first, the path of blessing. 
The first verses summarize God's commands for Israel. They're summed up in trusting and worshiping Him alone. And then the rest of the opening 13 verses here give a beautiful vision of what Israel can expect from God. There's three main categories of blessing here. The first is fruitfulness. So God promises to send rain and cause the land to be fruitful. Now, we've lost touch with the importance of rain, especially for survival. When it rains today, we consider it bad weather and we're tired of it. But in an agrarian society like this, rain was essential. Israel depended on seasonal rains to cause their crop to grow. Their options were either rain or famine. The closest we get to anything like this today is the fear of the past couple years of the supply chain breaking down. So for Israel, if they're faithful, God will make their land fruitful. He also promises security, promises protection from enemies. He'll give them peace and safety in the land. And the third category is the most central and the greatest blessing. It's the presence of God. Look at verses 11 and 12 again. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. So God will be with them. He'll dwell with them. They will know him. They'll enjoy his presence. In this whole section of blessings, no surprise here if you've been tracking with this series in Leviticus, intentionally echoes, on purpose, the ideal of Eden, the ideal life in the beginning. So think about these categories. That first category is faithfulness or fruitfulness. One scholar observed something really interesting about their fruitfulness here and their diet in particular here. It's intentionally connected to Eden. He noted that the diet is portrayed as vegetarian. So Israel is, of course, allowed to eat meat, and they will, But no meat is mentioned here. Why? Because they weren't eating meat in Eden. And verse 5 says they'll eat bread to satisfaction. That's a reversal of the curse in Genesis 3 that said the common state of humanity now is to eat bread through anxious toil, the, the sweat of your brow. So rather than anxious toil for bread, they'll eat, eat abundantly and eat to satisfaction. And then the second category is security. So rather than enemies attacking them and killing them, they'll be fruitful and multiply. And do you see that language in verse 9 here? That's a deliberate echo of Genesis 1, this fruitfulness and multiplication. That was humanity's blessing, Adam and Eve's blessing, in the beginning as they were called and blessed to fruitfulness. And then the third category is God's presence. That was the central blessing of humanity in its original ideal state. So Eden was the place where heaven and earth connected, where God's presence was with his people, and then after sin entered the world, Adam and Eve had to leave that land of God's presence, but now God will dwell with them and walk with them. And that image in verse 12 of God walking with them, that's probably a deliberate echo of God's presence with Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, 8 refers to God walking in the garden in the cool of the day seemingly indicating what he was used to doing with them. So here's the point. If Israel walks in faithfulness to God, he will walk in friendship with them. If they obey God, Israel will live again like Adam and Eve in the beginning, and the goal of creation will be fulfilled. They'll be fruitful, they'll multiply, they'll be blessed, and they'll enjoy God's presence. Now, why does it matter that we see this connection, that these blessings are reflecting Eden. Well, I think it matters for us because it means that these are not just ancient blessings for ancient people. I mean, we can get that impression if we do a quick reading of this chapter in Leviticus. Like, okay, ancient people, ancient blessings, what relevance does this have for me? But those are the categories of blessing that God made you and I to experience. And we're wired for them. I mean, think about it. Everybody is wired to long for and to try to attain these categories. They just don't know how to get them. So fruitfulness, that first category, this is in modern language, like success, prosperity, it's financial freedom. It's having savings and investments and assets, fruitful multiplying. This is being able to do what you want when you want. It's what so many people are striving for. The deeper idols in our culture are the idols of success and power and comfort. God made us to enjoy fruitfulness, 
And because we don't seek it from Him, we are striving after this in any way we can, and we replace God with these blessings and try to pursue satisfaction in success and power and comfort. But we are wired to have those in proper relation to God and from Him. The second category, security. Some of you may not care as much about that first category of fruitfulness. You just want to be safe. That's mainly what you live for. And you know this is true because of how fearful and anxious you can sometimes get. Anxiety is such a pervasive problem because we all long for security. And we live in uncertain times. And so we fear an economic crash. We fear war. We fear crime. We have locks on our doors and security cameras and security systems. We know the world is not the way it's supposed to be, so we rightly seek security. We wrongly seek it in the place of God, as if that'll be what we alone need, but we are wired for security. And then the third category is the blessing of God's presence. Now, we live in a secular age, and so many people don't realize they long for this, but we all do. We long for transcendence. And we seek it in different ways. Our post-Christian culture seeks it in all sorts of places because we were made to connect with God and to know Him. So God is giving Israel these pathways of blessing, and He's giving them this vision to, to find fulfillment in what they were always created to enjoy, and ultimately in God Himself. So here's the question then. What if Israel's not faithful? God isn't just saying, you get these. He's saying, if you are faithful to me, I'll bless you in these ways. Well, this leads to the next section then, which is the warning of judgment. The overall idea here is clear. If Israel is unfaithful to God, if they take the second path, they'll be judged. And this whole section is unfolding God's judgments for unfaithfulness. And as I read it here, you could tell this is is where most of the attention of this chapter is given, or most space, right? Right? Sections like this can raise a question for modern readers. Is God trigger happy? Is He harsh, demanding, impossible to please? When we look at Israel's story, big picture, do we get the impression that they were, they were kind of okay, they were fine, uh, but yeah, they slipped up a bit, and God just brought the hammer down on them? because he's so impatient. I don't like the God of the Old Testament. Man. So is that what's going on here? Well, no. To a widely held misunderstanding of the Old Testament, of course, God does have a standard of perfection, and rightly so. But for Israel, he offered sacrifices for their failings, for their imperfection, for their sins. He wasn't demanding of them in the covenant perfect obedience. He was demanding true obedience, true faithfulness. Just look at the beginning of this section in verses 14 and 15. He begins this way, but if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you will spurn my statutes, and if your soul abhors, hates my rules, so that you will not do all my commandments, but break my covenant. I mean, how many times does he have to put this, right? He doesn't say, if you listen to me and obey me, but you slip up in even just one point, it's over. No. He says, if you hate me, if you hate my commands, if you just reject this and just break this covenant, refuse to obey, then here's the consequences. So, this is like a marriage. We understand that spouses are faithful even if they sin in many ways, but they're unfaithful and viewed in that category of unfaithfulness when their posture and their behavior pattern are set against that marriage covenant. So, there's a difference between imperfect obedience and rejecting God and His ways altogether. You know, we also see God's patience throughout this. The whole section unfolds in stages. There's five stages. Each one escalates. So this means that these are not just punishments, they're acts of discipline, and that's the word that's used throughout here. And the purpose then at each stage is God saying, if you reject me, if you hate me and my commands, this is what I'm going to do to you as discipline to wake you up 
And if you still refuse, then I will do this set of judgments to wake you up. And if you still, I mean, this happens in five stages. It's ratcheted up. So he's not trigger happy. The, quant- the consequences start out minimal and then get bigger. So here's the stages. The first stage is in verses 14 to 17, and it's general. He says, diseases will spread, enemies will strike some of them down. And then in stage two, if Israel refuses to turn back to God, assuming if they do turn to him, this chapter does not get carried out to the end. But if they refuse, then God will bring more consequences. So look at these in verses 18 to 20. God says, and if in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sin. Sevenfold being this idea of completeness. And I'll break the pride of your power. That's their issue. They're prideful. God blesses them with all these things. They gain power. And this is the temptation in all of us, isn't it? Once we use God's gifts in the, in the, um, the ways that he's blessed us and wired us for success and it starts working, we forget about him. And we take pride and credit. So he says, I'll break the pride of your power, and I'll make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. So no rain, no productive fruit, and your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land will not yield its increase. The trees of the land shall not yield their their fruit. So this is reversing the promised blessing of fruitfulness, replacing it with famine. And what if they still don't repent? Well, then stage three. Verses 21 and 22, God will let wild beasts multiply. It would be beasts like lions and bears, maybe tigers, oh my. Uh, These were in the land back then. They're not as common right now, but lions and bears, you could read about them all through the Old Testament. They're around in the land, and they could be let loose um, if God removes his restraint. And they still refuse to turn back to God. Stage four then would be war. God would allow enemies to attack them, and Israel would be forced to gather in their cities But as they did this for protection, disease would spread, they wouldn't have enough bread, and if even then they still refuse and they say, forget you, God, we're we're not going to get this lesson, then stage five would be even worse, siege warfare. All supplies cut off, no hope of survival without food, so they're then starved to the point of cannibalism. That was a disturbing verse when we read it, right? Ugly picture. And this has happened many times through history, as recently as one city in World War II. That kind of siege warfare and cannibalism uh, being produced there because people go crazy from starvation. And now in the end, we see the climactic judgment is the reversal of all the blessings. It's exile. This is verse 33. And I will scatter you among the nations, and I will unsheath the sword after you, and your land shall be a desolation and your cities shall be a waste. So, no fruitfulness, no security, no life with God. All three categories emptied. So, if the blessings were an echo of Eden, then the judgments here are a repetition of Adam's fall, humanity's fall and the consequences. So, just like Adam sinned and was sent out of the land of Eden, Israel sins and would be sent out of their land as as well, away from God's presence and blessing. Why? What's the reason for this? Verse 39 tells us. You can read it with me. It says, because of their iniquity and also because of the iniquities of their fathers. So they will go into exile because of generations of sin, including their own. Now, verse 39 touches on a live topic today. So, as a side note, this is what we call uh, corporate responsibility or corporate confession. He's going to call them to confess the sin of themselves and past generations. So, people ask today, are future generations guilty of the sins of past generations? Should people confess the sins of their past family members, even if they're not guilty of the same sins? Are people responsible for wrongs done by other people in their geographic region or their ethnic heritage or their skin color? And I'd say the answer is, in most of the cases we think of today, uh, a qualified no, or we could just say this, it requires careful thinking. The Bible does have a category for this. It's right here in front of us. 
but there are clear limitations on how we apply it. So there is a connection between past generations and that last generation of Israel in this text here. But the key point is that Israel is not viewed as an innocent generation being punished for the sins of the past generations that were guilty. They are guilty because they're participating in the very same sins that the past generations committed. So they share in the guilt of the past because they continue on in practicing the same sins generation after generation after generation. And in Israel's case, they were also nationally in a covenant with God as a nation. So their whole national history was contingent upon their obedience as a group, as a nation, a defined nation, a defined group. So Israel was guilty because they were a, in a covenant as a defined group and people, and they participated in the same sins of the past. So bringing this into today, is a current group, however defined or generation, guilty of the sins of the past? And the answer is, maybe, maybe not. It depends on their present participation in those same sins, and it depends on the closeness of their connection, how bound they are together with that past generation as a group. Now, I want to add this as well. Just because you're not guilty of someone's past sins doesn't mean that there's nothing to do. We should still lament and grieve sins of the past. We should renounce sins of the past. We should call others to repent if they're repeating the sins of the past or new sins. And in Israel's case, each generation shared in this cumulatively growing guilt because they kept perpetuating the same sin. So by the time Jesus comes, he is pronouncing judgment over Israel for their sins and the past because when he's, he's denouncing the Israelite leaders, he's saying that they're guilty of all the same past ones because they're continuing them. So here's the two paths, the path of blessing and the path of judgment. What happens if they go down the second path, path, generation after generation, all the way to the bitter end? Well, this actually leads to the next section, and this is the hope of restoration. So if Israel ends up all the way down the path in judgment, what must they do? Well, really at any point down this path. Verses 40 to 41 show us, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery, that they committed against me, and also in walking contrary to me, so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then he will restore them as we read on. So if they confess their sins, so they're to confess their sins and the sins of the past generations, again, because this is, they're of the same cloth. Generation after generation, they refuse to turn to God. And they do this with humility. Notice the strange way verse 41 puts this. If then their uncircumcised heart is humbled. So this is not merely an outward change in behavior. This is a renovation of the heart because the heart is the source of the problem. So in the Old Testament, the idea of an uncircumcised heart is a heart that... that does not know and trust God. And then the idea of a circumcised heart is one that knows God and trusts God and is transformed. It's the heart that leads to an obedient life. So this is always the way back to God. Maybe you feel like you have drifted far from God. Or maybe you've run away from Him. Maybe you know that you've offended Him in massive ways in your life and you feel like there's a massive barrier between you and God. Or maybe just in ways you deem as smaller, but even this week. What do you do? All through the Bible, there's always one path back. It's the path of humble confession. You confess your sins humbly. He removes your sins. So God promises Israel that he'll remember his covenant and he'll restore them. Now, how do we apply this today? How does all this connect with us today? Now, I mean, we've been seeing this all throughout, but in a big way, how are we to relate to this text? Well, there's a couple wrong paths that many people take. First, some try to just apply 
this chapter or chapters like this in Israel's story directly to their lives as individuals today, as if this kind of path of blessing and judgment and restoration is kind of an individual covenant God has with each, each person at any given point in the day. Well, they read this chapter then, and they, we put ourselves in the place of Israel, and then a, typically when this is done, it's often applied in terms of health and wealth and prosperity. So they'd say, you're now in the position of Israel. If you obey God, He'll bless you with health, wealth, and prosperity now. And if you disobey, then He'll judge you. So if things aren't going well for you, you must be disobeying God. Do better. Second, some people treat this as a charter for other nations today. Many of them do this with America. And they don't do this knowingly, or or they wouldn't say, well, Leviticus 26 applies to America. But this is functionally what people are doing. They view this as a charter for a modern nation. So America did start out with a lot of Christians. And Uh, there was a lot of Christian influence exerted on the formation and foundation of this nation, which is one of the reasons why there's so much good and blessing in this nation because of the wisdom of all of this. But America was never in a covenant relationship with God. And so we can't put America in the place of Israel here and say, see, if America obeys God, then God will bless us. And if we don't, then he'll judge us. And then different people define what it looks like for America to obey God. What does that mean? That our uh, laws are a little bit more in step with his, or most of us are Christians, or government leaders are Christians, or we just get to a point where, as a sense, we think the majority of people are honoring him so we can say we as a nation trust God. It's a little bit vague, but that's the idea. Now, it is good for a nation to be filled with Christians and to have Christian influence. And it's true that when a nation is wise and virtuous, things go better for it, and this matters. And if it plunges into moral chaos, it'll plunge into societal chaos, and that's bad for real people. We're seeing this all over in our nation. But no nation is in a covenant with God like Israel was, and so that shapes our expectations. God makes nations rise and fall for His own mysterious reasons. Sometimes wicked nations rise. Sometimes morally good nations fall. Others take ideas in this text and apply it to the modern nation of Israel today. But this still is not a charter for them today as it was for ancient Israel. The modern nation of Israel is not filled with people who know the one true God anymore. They've rejected the Messiah Jesus. They're no longer in a covenant relationship with Him as a nation. And many don't even claim to know God. Largely atheist. So what do we do with this chapter then? How does this relate to today? If it's not kind of a one-to-one for individuals or America or Israel or anything like that, what do we do with it? Well, the answer is found in seeing that this is part of a bigger story. God was laying two paths before Israel, so we have to see what ended up happening. Where did the story go? What's the rest of the story? Do you want to know what the rest of the Old Testament is about? This Big part of the Bible, the rest of the middle of it, after this, all the way in the New Testament. What's this whole section all about? It's essentially the unfolding of this chapter across generations. So the rest of the Old Testament is the story of Israel's sometimes faithfulness and therefore blessing, and then mainly their unfaithfulness and their experience of the judgments, leading all the way to that last stage of exile. And then it ends with the hope of restoration. Now, they did experience a partial restoration. Some Israelites came back to the land, and that was an act of God, but it wasn't the full restoration. They weren't, by and large, faithful to God. They didn't experience these categories of fruitfulness and security and God's presence, which is why all the way until Jesus came, they're all thinking, where's the restoration? A bunch of us are back here. Plenty of us are still scattered. Where's God? Why are we ruled over by our enemies? And so the Old Testament ends with Israel waiting for God to change their hearts and for Him to humble them and restore them. The Old Testament story isn't just about Israel, because remember what we've seen here. Israel's story parallels humanity's story in the beginning. So at this moment, 
in Leviticus 26, as God is giving Israel their two paths forward, they are in the position, and they're to think of themselves in the position of Adam again. They have a path of blessing held out before them, and they have a path of judgments held out before them. And sadly, they end up repeating Adam's sin again, and therefore leaving the land, just like Adam had to leave. And this is how we see how this connects to you and I. Because as Israel's story unfolds, we see that that restoration that's promised at the end will not just be for Israel. It, the prophet saw that it will be for people from all nations as well. Because it's not just Israel that needs restoration by the end of the Old Testament. It's Israel and humanity, not just the children of Israel, but the children of Adam that need restored. Adam fell, and then Israel fell, partly as a picture of how all humans fall, and therefore all humans need restoration from God. So where does the story ultimately go then? Well, it ultimately comes to a culmination in Jesus, and this is how you and I find ourselves in this story. Jesus came to unlock the blessings for Israel and all humanity, all who will trust Him. And we can understand how Jesus does this by thinking about Jesus in light of this very chapter that we read. See how He fulfills each of the sections of this chapter. So when Jesus came, He was once again repeating the story of Adam and Israel, but doing it differently. So He was like Israel when He came, and like Adam when He came, a path of blessing and a path of judgment was held out before Him for faithfulness and unfaithfulness. So he was like Adam and Israel with the same choice before him. And what did he do? Well, in his life and in his ministry, in the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John record this for us, he was faithful where everyone else failed, where you failed, where Adam and Israel failed. And one of the places we see this is in those, that temptation story of Jesus in the wilderness. He was tempted in the same ways that Adam was tempted. Adam and Eve were tempted. And he was tempted in the same ways that Israel was tempted. And we're not going to spend time going there uh, and looking at it in detail, but even the way that he fights temptation is to quote from Deuteronomy, which describes Israel's failure in the wilderness in their temptation, the first generation's failure. Jesus quotes from it, but not in failing, but in succeeding, because he's saying, I'm here to do it right this time. I'm going to be the one true and faithful Israel and Israelite and Adam and human being. Where everyone else failed, I will triumph and I will have a victory. So what does that mean? If he walked through these first 13 verses and did them perfectly, never failing, never sinning, no bad attitude, not one moment. Well, he deserves the blessings then, doesn't he? He earned the blessings the only person in all human history who can read to verse 13 and say, I deserve this. I, have, I alone have earned this. We all forfeit our right to fruitfulness and security and God's presence. We deserve eternal judgment. We deserve these stages to get ratcheted up beyond five stages into a sixth, which is eternal. He should get the blessing. And so this is why the cross is so surprising and is so brilliant and counterintuitive. Because what was the cross about? It was the culmination of the judgments laid out in this chapter. But those judgments should fall on Israel and us and every nation and every person. Not Jesus. He is the one person who did not deserve this. And yet there he was on purpose. All the blessings removed, parched, beaten and struck by enemies, no safety. He experienced the ultimate exile from the land and God's presence. He endured the, the hell of judgment. Why? This wasn't an accident, right? It's not just poor, poor Jesus. Things didn't work out for him, right? Um, he was doing it for you and me. He deserves the blessing. We deserve the judgment. He took our judgment so we could get the blessing. And then in his resurrection, we see him experience the restoration of this chapter. He's restored 
to fruitfulness and security in the Father's presence. And so, we're invited to embrace this path of restoration that He has given to us by humbly confessing our sins, receiving Him. When we do this, and as part of this process, God circumcises our hearts. He gives us new hearts, even so that we will turn to Jesus. One of the lessons of this story of Israel is that nobody returns to God on their own. Israel had the best chance, and they didn't. Generation after generation, most of them kept resisting. It's a story that that one of the main points of the Old Testament story of Israel is, I guess nobody can do this. And not because no one can be perfect, but no one can even be just broadly faithful. Generation after generation, they had the best shot, and they failed. The other nations failed. You and I know we fail. So, what do we do in response to all of it? Well, we see ourselves as part of a big story. We all get our identity within some sense of story. Right? Sam and Frodo got their sense that they were part of an epic story and, and purpose, and therefore that gave them the encouragement to keep going. It helped them understand what the stakes were in their lives. We all have stories we tell ourselves. We all have stories other people tell about ourselves. Many people in our time are trying to write history or rewrite it in certain ways to tell a different story leading up to the present generation because that will shape our sense of who we are and therefore how we live, for better or worse. But this is the biggest story. And there's a reason why the Bible is essentially telling us this big story. And we always talk about this big story. It's because it's our story. We find ourselves within it, and it's intended to shape our sense of who we are and what in the world we're doing here our identity. When God told Israel their story, he was, he was teaching them to see their own life in light of Adam and Eve in the beginning, to understand their life as a repetition of what happened to them. They were to see themselves as a new Adam with a huge opportunity before them for faithfulness and blessing, but they failed. And that was actually anticipated because God's writing a bigger story, a story that would lead to Jesus, who once again would stand again as Israel and Adam But instead of Jesus winning a victory for himself alone, he came to secure your blessing, doing what you and I couldn't do for ourselves. And so now you and I find ourselves as part of this story, and we now have a path set before us. You can take the path of humbly trusting Jesus, confessing your sins, receiving his grace, being united to him, sharing in his righteousness with humility and confession and joy. Or you can reject him. And then the judgments of this chapter, in their ultimate form of exile from God's presence forever, come upon you rather than on Jesus. We also have a story to tell. It's the big story, including Israel's part in it. This is what people need to hear. Our culture is increasingly detached from the bigger stories of history, people are rewriting history. It's leading many to live detached, floating, fluid sense of identity. So we have a story to tell, and it connects with people who don't have a story anymore, or don't know where they're going, or don't know where they're from, or who they are. This story explains why we all want a fruitful life, why we all long for security, why we all long for transcendence. And it explains why, in the words of theologian T. Swift, hi, it's me, I'm the problem. Not that she meant it that way, but we're the problem. Your problem in life is you. My problem is me. That's the story of the Bible. And what's the answer? Jesus is the answer. And he comes to us with grace. So he's the story, uh, the story's hero. He came to rescue and restore us. So who will you invite to hear this story? And there's a lot of ways you can tell the story. You could say you want to see a pretty seemingly obscure chapter from a few thousand years ago, Leviticus 26, and just walk through it. You could say, "Um, do you own a Bible? I'd love to give you one. Here, let me put a bookmark in the Gospel of Mark, and you can read the story of Jesus. I'm convinced that he's the most brilliant, morally perfect, beautiful life in all human history, and that it matters for us personally today. I'd love to talk to you about it. Could be that you just Give them a Bible and encourage them to read it. It could be that you invite them here on Sunday to hear the story. It could be you invite them to your small group or a small group dinner. 
and over time, just befriend them, ask them what they think about these big things in life. Do you long to be connecting with something transcendent or fruitful? Or do I get anxious? Do you get anxious? Why do we get anxious? You know, we were made for something more. We're, we're actually part of a story. I don't know if you believe that, but I believe that. Here's the story I think we're a part of. That may sound crazy to you. What do you think of that? And they may say it sounds crazy, and that's okay. Um, but get people thinking about this big story and the story of Jesus. So who will you pray for to receive this new heart? And you know, the part of the good news of this whole thing is that when Jesus restores us, He doesn't just restore us to continue to live a basically unfaithful but now forgiven life. He actually transforms us, not only so that we humbly come to Him for forgiveness, but we humbly stay with Him and become like Him by the Holy Spirit. Not perfectly right now, but truly being transformed to the image of Jesus, actually beginning to grow in faithfulness to God. Various measures, but miraculously true. And I see it in so many of you. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your uh, great mercy in revealing this story to us and giving us grace through Jesus. We pray that You would transform us to be humble, that You would help us to see our identity as part of this wonderful story and united to Jesus. We pray for anyone here who has not found a home in You and Christ and forgiveness. We pray that they would trust in You through Jesus and that You'd give them a new heart. And we pray that you would help us to have conversations with people about Jesus, about what really matters in life, about where we get our identity, about the stories that we believe are true in the world, in that you would provide opportunities, ones that we couldn't create for ourselves even, uh, to talk about Jesus, and that you would bring people to yourself as a result of our engaging with them. I pray this in Jesus' name.